Hey guys, Prime Matrix 1986 here, and today I wanted to do my official review over The Walking Dead Rise of the Governor. Uh, this is the first novel in the book series created by Robert Kirkman and J. Bone Nsinga, and uh, it is absolutely amazing. Um, I will say, if you are a Walking Dead fan, especially a comic book fan, you need to go read this book immediately. Uh, the beginning is kind of slow, but once I get to Atlanta onwards, it just gets better and better and better and better. So before we begin, this will contain spoilers for the comic book series and of course the uh, book series, uh, at least this book, um, so keep that in mind. So, we start off this story um, with the characters of Philip Blake. Uh, Philip Blake um, is like the de facto leader of this group. Um, his wife died before the apocalypse in a car crash. And of course, he and his wife um, had a daughter called Penny. Uh, obviously, you know, you guys know who Penny is. Uh, she's from the comic book series, and of course, here she is zombified. Uh, obviously, she's alive at this point in time in the book. And uh, this is a huge spoiler, by the way, for this next character. And uh, this character is Brian Blake, which is the older character of Philip. Now, I know a lot of you are probably wondering, Brian Blake? No, this is the governor, and his name is Philip Blake. You would be right, but this will be explained later on. Um, and it's a huge twist in this book. Uh, but again, I'm going to go ahead and talk about this later. Um, but we do get introduced to some other characters called Nick and Bobby. And Nick and Bobby are uh, pretty much childhood friends of Philip Blake. They've been friends since high school. You know, they always used to hang out, drink beer, and all that good stuff. Um, so, uh, that's a set of characters. Very, very good group dynamic. Um, so, we start off this story here at um, Wiltshire Estates. And this is uh, the first big comic Easter egg in this book. Uh, because, of course... In the combo book series, uh, Tyrese, Rick, and their group all go to Wiltshire States for a little bit. Um, so, yes, this is indeed the same place. So while they're here at Wiltshire States, uh, you know, we start off where uh, Philip, Bobby, and Nick are killing all kinds of zombies in this house. And um, Brian is in a closet holding Penny. Uh, at this point in time, uh, Brian is sick. And uh, they describe Brian as like a weakling, you know, he's just a low life nobody really uh, he was married once but you know she left him and went back to her country i think she was from jamaica or something like that you know he's an entrepreneur but his shops have always failed uh even though he graduated from college he just i mean life doesn't treat him right and he doesn't really do much about it um he always kind of watches over his niece penny um which of course will be very important later on um as far as his character development goes um but uh, Brian is the older brother, um, but again, he is just a weakling, you know. Philip is a more masculine guy, even though he's a couple years younger. Um, but while they're here at this house, uh, Brian notices a picture with the family that lived there in the house. And uh, he notices that, um, you know, the rest of the group killed all the zombies except one little boy. And uh, he has a big fear that there's a little boy is somewhere in the house. And everybody kind of just shrugs it off, and they go days and days and days uh, living in this house, and everything seems to be fine, you know? They build a little barricade, uh, everything's going good, until one day while they're outside building, uh, Bobby actually goes up to the doghouse while he's working, and that little zombified boy jumps out and starts to eat Bobby alive. Uh, and of course, Philip and Nick run over there, and uh, they kill the zombie, and they try to save Bobby. Uh, but it just doesn't work. Bobby dies, and, uh, you know, they have to stay there, I think it's for one night, and then the next morning they decide to hightail out of there. Now, before they leave, Brian, uh, asks Philip if he could put up a sign to warn other people in case they try to come by. And he writes down on a sign, uh, all dead, do not enter. And, uh, obviously this here is a big Easter egg to the comic book series. Um, you know, whenever, like I said earlier, whenever Rick and Tyrese and their group went to Wiltshire Estates, um, you know, everything was going good until Rick saw this sign, you know, the snow melted off. And that's whenever walkers poured into the town and they were forced to leave. Uh, so very, very cool knowing that Brian Blake, who would eventually become the governor, wrote this sign that Rick Grimes would read. So from here they uh, go on to Atlanta, and uh, as we know, Atlanta is not a great place from Rick Grimes' story. 
and they get there and it is overran with walkers absolutely overran um you know they found this big vehicle and uh, they go around all these corners they run over a lot of walkers and uh, they crash the vehicle now i'm going to read this quote here and this quote says that in the frenzy moments before the crash brian glimpses a row of uh, deer licked shop windows hatless busts of bald mannequins empty jewelry display frayed wires going out of vacant floorboards all of it blurred behind the wire mesh display windows now this may be a huge reference to a very important comic book um, cover and that cover would be of issue number one um, if you guys look right here closely in the background what do you see you see exactly that you see mannequins the bust of windows the wires um, it, it describes it very very well and I'm not sure if this is the place where they crashed into but I feel like it was a little Easter egg maybe not intentional I don't know but I'm gonna consider it an Easter egg either way so from here um, the group gets out of the vehicle and uh, they have to of course leave the building because you know zombies are starting to catch up with them they run down this alleyway and they see a woman on top of this building um you know she has them come inside and it's a big apartment complex and um we get introduced to this woman and her name is april charmers um now we also get introduced to uh, the other two people living there which are her family which is tara and yes tara this is her and david now of course these two pictures are from the tv show but if you look here at this information a book has the characters of tara april and david chalmers the TV show has Tara, Lily, her daughter Megan, and David Ch uh, Chambers. Uh, you know, they, they, they changed the last name just a little bit. And uh, just for some little fun facts here to see which one got it first. Uh, the Rise of the Governor book was released in October of 2011. And the first episode with the Chambers family aired in November of 2013. So yes, uh, Tara and her family was in fact uh, derived from this book which i thought was very very cool um so pretty much while they are here um everything is going good everything is going fine um we also get a nice little easter egg where philip um says biters i heard you say that before who came up with that one and april says that's my dad's term it kind of stuck and philip says i like it and they start using the term biters a lot. And of course, again, another Easter egg to the comic book series. Uh, we see right here the governor says that is unless one of our fighters gets too close to the biters and they're full after the fight. Um, and of course, the governor uses the term biters a lot. So do all the people in Woodbury. So it's kind of neat to see where he got that term from. Uh, because again, we know whenever Philip starts using that, Brian and Nick and everybody else starts using it as well. So very, very cool. But, uh, yeah, while they're here, um, you know, April starts to form a really, really good relationship with Penny, who has been pretty quiet, you know, most of the time here. Um, Nick and Philip and Brian clear out the rest of the apartment because there were some zombies inside. And uh, Brian actually kills his first zombie. And he, I think he pukes it, like, right afterwards, and they make fun of him about it. Um, he starts to kind of get over his sickness at this point. Uh, and, you know, Nick, he actually makes, like, a makeshift catwalk to a catty corner building and sets up these little safe zones uh, for them to go out and get supplies, which is very, very neat of him to do. And uh, all the while, April and Philip start to form a little bit of a relationship. They actually start to kind of bond uh, in a very intimate way. Uh, but, you know, of course, problems do persist. Uh, David, unfortunately, dies, and uh, he comes back as a zombie. And this is how we actually learn... Um, you know, that obviously people come back no matter if they have a bite or not. That's how all these characters learn that happens. Um, now, one very, very uh, big turning point here in this little uh, group we have now is one day April and Philip were outside together in this, uh, I think it's like a catwalk that separates two buildings together, and uh, they start to have sex. And while they're having sex, April decides she wants to stop. However, Philip keeps on going and he essentially rapes her. Uh, yeah, he rapes her. And, um, you know, they, they walk back in a very, very silent way. And uh, it's, it's a pretty, pretty bad scene. Um, and the next morning they wake up, all their stuff was next to the door, and Tara wakes up Philip with a gun to his head and pretty much forces all of them out of the building. And uh, that's the end of that little part. Uh, because, again, you know, 
Philip made a big mistake, and uh, he doesn't tell Brian or Nick about this. Um, he just pretty much says, yeah, you know, she went crazy or whatever. From here, they uh, actually go to this toy store, and out back they find this motorcycle shop. And uh, they go into the shop, they get all kinds of gear, and uh, they find these motorcycles, and they put some gas into them. And they decide to finally leave Atlanta. Um, now, while they're leaving Atlanta, um, you have Penny on the back of Philip's motorcycle, and you have uh, Brian on the back of Nick's motorcycle. And, uh, you know, while they're riding along, uh, Brian starts to kind of daydream. And uh, I'm going to quote this. He says that um, he imagines an enormous sprawling fortress with gardens and walks and impenetrable moats and security fences and guard towers. Now, what does this sound like to you guys? The prison. Yes, that is exactly um, what this sounds like, you know? It has the fences. Uh, I think they even have some gardens there growing. Of course, I have the guard towers. Um, and maybe this is a big reason why uh, the governor eventually wants the prison. Of course, you know, he wanted it because obviously it is better fortified. But it seems like that this is an idea he had for a while or something very, very similar to it. Now, also, while they're on the road, Brian notices a couple quick flashes in the corner of um, the rearview mirror of the motorcycle. And, uh, you know, it starts to get dark time, and Philip signals them to go over to this uh, farmhouse. And it's a very, very nice farmhouse. You know, they stop there for the night, and, uh, you know, while they are there, Brian tells Nick and Philip that he thinks they are being followed. That he has seen a couple flashes in the rearview mirror, and, you know, they think that maybe, ah, he's just imagining it or whatever. Um, now, one very, very good touching moment here is, uh, Brian and Philip are sitting in front of a, a fireplace, and, you know, Brian tells Philip, he's like, look, man, you know, I know that me and you don't always get along, but I'm your brother. You know, tell me what happened back there at the Atlanta, um, uh, apartment house with, you know, the, the Chalmers family. And Philip admits to Brian that he raped her. He's like, you know, I got carried away and I couldn't help myself, just, you know, I had to keep on going, and I did. Um, and I ruined it. You know, I ruined something very, very good for all of us and for my daughter. Um, and Philip gets very, very torn up about that. Um, now also while they're here, you know, you skip forward, uh, about two weeks, you know, that they live there. And, uh, they put all these cans around the house to alert them of any humans or walkers. And, uh, you know, a couple nights out of those two weeks, Brian is laying in his bed. And, uh, he sees, uh, you know, some, like, beams of flashlights go through his window. And again, he kind of thinks maybe he's just imagining it here and there, but one night they hear the cans rattle and they go downstairs and they actually found the old vintage gun. It don't work. They don't have the shells, but they use it for intimidation. And Philip meets uh, this man who's, a, who's pretty much in charge of this little group of uh, these trashy people. You know, they, they surround the house by vehicles. They put on the lights. Uh, kind of reminiscent to how Negan and his group did in the comic book series. It's kind of how I imagined it. But anyways, though, um, so they surround the house, and, um, you know, th these people are pretty much uh, some, like, meth head, kind of country-ass bastards. And they tell Philip that they want the place, you know? They're going to take it from them. And uh, Philip says, okay, fine, as long as you let us leave peacefully. So they get their things, they all begin to leave. And uh, while they're, you know, walking out, uh, there are these two men with sawed-off shotguns. Um, and... Brian is walking with Penny, and Philip whispers to him, you know, hey, look, these guys are not going to let us go unscathed. Never I tell you to run. And right at about that time, uh, Philip tells them to run, and that's whenever they, like, a big gunfight ensues. So Brian runs, runs, and runs with Penny, and he hides. And uh, they do it in a very, very creepy way, too, where, you know, a guy starts to approach, and uh, Philip and Nick take him out. And they get the guns, and they go back to, uh, you know, again, have this big firefight. And um, Brian eventually hides behind this tractor, and he sees a big guy approaching. And uh, I think it was the guy who was the leader, I believe. I can't remember. But he goes up, and he fires, you know, barely, barely, barely misses Brian. And he starts to run with Penny, but Penny goes limp. And, uh, you know, he starts running and hides, and turns out she was shot. Uh, from the back out through the stomach and she's basically has like, this big hole blown through her and um, You know the guy catches up to Brian and uh, puts a gun to his head and right at about that point Philip shows up and kills that guy and of course Philip freaks out 
At that point, he holds his daughter and, you know, is begging her not to uh, die. But, of course, he does indeed die. And uh, Philip gets extremely pissed, and he beats the hell out of Brian. Kicks the shit out of him. And mind you, he's wearing steel toe boots. Um, but, yeah, he beats the ever-living hell out of Brian. Um, and Nick tried to stop it, but, of course, he couldn't. So, they go back to the house, and uh, Brian is, I mean, beat the hell. You know, he may have a couple of cracked ribs, a couple of broken bones, and uh, Nick is there trying to help him heal and relax, while Philip has two of the um, people captive in the um, barn shed, and um, he pretty much starts torturing them. He, uh, it's like a couple, I believe, and he rapes the woman, and um, he starts beating the hell out of them, and all the while, he has Penny, of course, as a walker, chained up to a tree outside, and... You know, Nick knows all about this. Brian don't because, again, he's in bed resting. But Nick starts to talk to Brian saying, look, you know, Philip is losing his shit. Uh, you know, he has his daughter outside. He's going outside to talk to her, read her bedtime stories. And he has his two of those people out in the bar and, it's, you know, he's doing God knows what to them. Um, and, uh, of course, later on, uh, Nick and Brian, they sneak out of the house. You know, Brian gets a little bit better where he can start to walk around some. And they go to the barn and uh, they find the two people in there. Uh, beat the hell you know the woman has her panties and her um, pants down to her ankles she's beat to shit and she barely manages the words you know please kill me and at that point Nick does indeed kill um, both of them out of mercy and um, Philip shows up and he gets very 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 angry and uh, he, he gets really fucking pissed at them for killing uh, the two captives and uh, I can't remember if this was before or after, I believe it was before, but there's this quote right here I'd like to read, where um, Brian says to uh, Philip, he says, the whole thing has Nick on edge, and you can hear things out there at night I'm talking about. Nick thinks you're like pulling their fingernails off. And I think this was a reference to the comic book series, where uh, the governor, a.k.a. Brian, um, gets tortured by Michonne, and she does just that. She pulls off his fingernails. So I think that was a nice little reference, if it indeed was that. So uh, from here, they pretty much decide to leave the uh, house. Um, at first, Nick was going to stay back, but um, he decided to go with him because, you know, Brian talks him into going with strength and numbers, basically. Um, I think they leave the house because Philip, you know, he basically can't take living there no more, considering what happened to Penny. So they get in this truck and, um, you know, they, they put Penny in the back where she can't fall out or anything. And, uh, you know, they're driving along the road and the truck messes up. So they have to start walking and they uh, eventually come upon the sign. And again, I want to read this quote where it says, They continue on less than a mile down the road. They come upon a dented sign. Woodbury, one mile. And I think this was a reference to the comic book series where we see Axel here with a sign as, of course, busted up. And it says Woodbury 1. So, um, I'm not sure. I mean, it says right here, it says, you know, Woodbury 1 mile. I uh, don't say that here on this sign. Maybe it's a reference. Maybe it's a different sign. Who knows? But uh, either way, I thought it was a nice little uh, wink, if it is indeed. Um, and another thing is, you know, while they uh, start to get near Woodbury, it says right here that a uh, Walmart sign rises above a stand of ancient live oaks. The uh, golden arches of a McDonald's are visible not far beyond the Walmart. Um, and, of course, here we see exactly just that. Um, we see uh, the McDonald's, the Walmart, and this is ripped straight from the pages of um, the Governor's Special. And I thought that was very, very neat, because I remember reading that, and I caught right onto that. I was like, huh, that sounds very, very uh, familiar for sure. And uh, they eventually approach Woodbury, you know, with their uh, hands up, and uh, there are three men outside the wall working on something. And one of them calls out Bruce, and this character right here is called Bruce. Uh, he's one of the governor's henchmen, I believe, in the comic book series. He wasn't a big character, but I remember he was there for a little bit. Um, so, yeah, we actually get uh, Bruce in this novel. And uh, they pretty much go inside Woodbury, and it's pretty much a hellhole. Everybody there, they just kind of ignore each other. There's really no form of community. Um, the only type of leadership we have are these three military men. One of them, the leader, is a Marine called Gavin. And um, he's pretty much just a giant dick. Uh, really, really big asshole. You know, he, um, he, he rapes women. 
he, he does all kinds of shit, and he's just a dick. And uh, they actually referred to him as the mayor, which I thought this was actually a funny little reference, because in real life, Robert Kirkman has said before that he was originally going to call the governor the mayor, but he decided the governor sounded better, so he went with that. So I feel like that maybe he recycled an idea here, which is pretty neat. Um, while they're here at Woodbury, um, Brian goes to see the doctor of the town, who is none other than Dr. Stevens. And, uh, you know, Dr. Stevens says that he's healing up nicely. You know, he does have a couple cracked bones here and there, but nothing too bad. Um, and also, uh, whenever they get to their apartment, um, this, again, nice little reference, um, it says a huge rectangular fish tank next to the TV, brooming with scum and the tiny floating corpses of neglected goldfish. Um, and I thought that was neat because, of course, we know the governor eventually does watch dead heads and uh, dead things in the fish tank. So very, very cool. Um, and we'll actually touch on this fish tank thing here in a second. Uh, so keep this in mind. Um, but moving on, um, turns out there is this dirt track here. And the dirt track is, of course, a reference to the comic book series. This is where they have those zombie arena fights at. And, um, you know, they actually have these erases here, and it's actually kind of neat, because if you look in the background, you can see the derby cars, you know, the race cars they use. So, I thought that was awesome, you know, it seems like this is something that, um, you know, Jay Boyne and Singa looked at, and they made something out of it. Something's out of the background, you know? I mean, I thought this was just amazing writing, so big props to Jay uh, and Robert Kirkman, this is just amazing. I mean, that attention to detail. But while they're having this big um, race, you know, of course, it's very, very loud. And uh, Nick loads up a gun, and Brian walks into him doing it. Um, and also, uh, to keep in mind, Penny is, you know, still a zombie, uh, chained up in the laundry room. And Philip um, actually has brought her, um, you know, dead meat from one of the people that died there recently. And he brings a bucket, which I thought was pretty cool because, you know, uh, the bucket we do see in the comic book series where he does use that. Uh, so very, very, very neat little reference there um, to see how the whole, um, you know, meat in the whole bucket thing started. And it was with Philip. Um, but moving on, again, like I was saying, um, what happens is Nick actually gets the shotgun and goes outside. And Brian is like, dude, stop, please, please stop. And, uh, you know, Philip is actually outside trying to rape a woman. Uh, either rape her or kill her and feed her to Penny, or maybe even both. And Nick tells Brian, you know, dude, Philip is gone. You know, he's twisted in the head. You know, Penny, she's dead, and he's talking to her. He's feeding her, um, you know, dead meat. You know, we've got to stop this. And they go outside, and there's this big, you know, pretty much conversation between um, Nick and Philip. And long story short, um, Nick ends up killing Philip. He actually shoots him in the back of the head. And um, blows his brains out. And he accidentally kills the lady as well. And at this point, Brian actually pulls out a gun. And he blows off Nick's head for killing his brother. Um, and, you know, he holds Philip in his arms while he's dying. And uh, he pretty much, you know, reminisces about all the good times they had. You know, how they had their first beer together. How Philip protected him during all this. And, you know, Brian tells Philip, he's like, you know, I, I can't survive without you. I don't want to be alone, you know. Um, but of course, this draws some walkers and the uh, race car sounds do as well. And uh, Brian has to hide on top of this vehicle for a couple hours. And uh, at this point, he starts to really think about things. And if he gets a chance, he heads on back to his apartment. And he actually sits down and he stares at that fish tank, which again, nice little comic reference. And it says he sits there and he just stares at that fish tank for almost a whole day, really. He doesn't eat, he doesn't drink, he just thinks about everything about how, you know, this this new twisted way of life is. And all the while, you know, there's a lot of commotion outside. And he eventually snaps out of it and goes outside. And at this big town hall meeting, um, pretty much the the leader, you know, the mayor and his two little henchmen uh, have a big town meeting and say, look, you know, this is martial law, whether you guys like it or not. You know, we're going to be the leaders. You're going to do exactly what we say when we say it. And if you don't like it, we'll fucking kill you. And uh, there's this older guy who says, man, you know, I'm leaving this place. And while he tries to leave, the mayor kills him. And everybody is shocked. And uh, there's also this guy that tries to calm down the mayor. And uh, his name is Martinez. And uh, yeah, Martinez. You guys remember him, right? Yeah. 
he was uh, the governor is pretty much like his right hand man, or at least one of them in the comic book series. Uh, so pretty cool that Martinez makes a brief little appearance during the end of this book. Um, but at this point, Brian he pretty much loses his shit. Uh, you know, he finally realizes that you know he it's almost like he's reborn in a way. You know, after everything's happened to him, he can't be a puss how he has been, and he pretty much you know starts to look at his brother. And his ideology as a way of inspiration in a way. So he then gets his gun and walks through the crowd and blows off um, the mayor's head. Now keep in mind his two henchmen uh, ran after some of the scared citizens so they're not in the room. So everybody in that room you know starts to praise Brian and um, you know Brian tells them look you know who, you know who here has firearms and of course a couple of people raise their hands and he says you know look you know we outnumber them we can go take care of them. And uh, Martinez approaches Brian and says, hey, what's your name? And Brian looks at him and says, Philip, Philip Blake. So big, big, big way to end the book, you know, and that's the end of this review though, guys. And I have to say, um, you know, they couldn't have, uh, you know, used this format any better with that cliffhanger because, you know, if you were to make this to a comic book, for example, you would obviously see who Brian is. You automatically know, oh wait, that's the governor. Um, but throughout this entire book, you know, you would start to think, oh, well, it was Philip Blake and his daughter. Of course it's the governor. But whenever you find out Philip dies, you were so shocked. And at first you're like, wait a second, this makes sense. You know, he's doing governor things. He's raping, he's feeding his daughter, he's talking to her, but then he dies. And then you realize Brian has pretty much been the main character of the entire book. And he is very prominent, you know, and, you know, once you, like, reread it and you go through it, you're like, oh, my God, you know, I, you can look at the book in a whole new dimension, a whole new way, and they couldn't have had done any more better with that. It, it is just absolutely amazing. So, guys, that's going to be it for this video. Uh, let me know what you think about this book in the comments section below. And let me know if you have read it or if you have not read it. Um, if you haven't, you definitely, definitely need to go out there and buy this book. Uh, it is, it's great. It, I mean, especially if you are a Walking Dead comic book fan, this book is definitely a must. Uh, also, little announcement, um, I will be doing the reviews over the road uh, to Woodbury and the Fall of the Governor Part 1 and Part 2 eventually. Um, it's just a matter of time for me to read those books, so uh, I do plan on doing it unless something gets in the way, and uh, even after those, I plan on buying the rest of the books uh, once I catch up to the novel series, uh, at least for the ones I have right now. But guys, that's going to be it for this video. Uh, thank you all for watching. I hope everybody enjoyed, and I will definitely catch you all later.